Well, thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts at the end of the afternoon uh, after a couple really fascinating presentations uh, about the way uh, biodiversity information uh, can really more rapidly and more extensively inform uh, actual conservation action. So uh, before I make any remarks, I just wanted to note that being here in the school of Aldo Leopold, uh, that very famous report written by his uh, animal ecology, uh, uh, animal management, wildlife management son, uh, Starker, uh, which informed the management of the national parks of the United States for close to 50 years, uh, had basically needed to be redone uh, to reflect some of the realities of the new dynamics in nature from climate change, some of which we just saw on the screen. <clears throat> and so there is a brand new report out called Revisiting Leopold. Uh, I think it's actually quite good. I'm biased because I was on the committee, of course. Uh, but it's only 23 pages, little pages, uh, just like the original report. Uh, and it's really very well written, not by the committee, uh, but informed by the committee. Uh, and I, I commend it to you as uh, a way to help think about how we manage all of, of the, the biology of our planet uh, in such a uh, time of change. So I wanted to sort of address sort of two aspects of the title of this symposium. One is sort of the, the global scale uh, and the other being spatial biodiversity science. Uh, and so I, I sort of come to, to this having been through a lot of international meetings in the last two or three years, uh, one of which, of course, was Rio plus 20. Uh, and one has to state very candidly that Rio plus 20, at least from an intergovernmental point of view, was a really serious disappointment. I mean, basically nothing was actually committed to by the governments uh, at Rio. Uh, a much better picture if you looked outside the actual uh, convention center itself and looked at what the private sector was doing, uh, what civil society was doing, and what levels of government below the national level, like cities and states and provinces, were doing. Uh, but nonetheless, if you add it all up uh, and you, you really look at the challenge uh, squarely, uh, it is just not at the scale that we need to be acting. Uh, and it, it seems to me that uh, most of the international negotiations seem to be treating the issue of the environment uh, as though it's just sort of yet another issue that they have to negotiate about. Uh, and I really I feel very strongly that uh, the focus on trying to stop at two degrees of, of climate change uh, is actually seriously uninformed and seriously misguided. Uh, that is a world without tropical coral reefs. And one twelfth of humanity depends on tropical coral reefs for their well-being. And I'm not going to sit here and add to building the case for why two degrees is too much. Uh, but I think we all collectively need to be uh, working on that, uh, building more evidence, uh, and basically pressing those who engage in these kinds of discussions and agreements uh, to face the reality uh, that the biology of our planet uh, is not going to be well served by letting climate change go to two degrees. And then, of course, if you, we, we really want to stop at two degrees, uh, global emissions have to peak uh, in 2016. Uh, so is it all over? 
Uh, no, it isn't all over, uh, especially if you look at the significant portion of excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that actually comes from three centuries of destruction and degradation of ecosystems worldwide. Uh, and there's absolutely no reason why a good chunk of that, maybe 50 parts per million of CO2, can't be brought out back out of the atmosphere uh, by taking on ecosystem restoration uh, at a planetary scale. So having made that point, I just want to add that in to the way we think about spatial planning, uh, that we have to actually think about managing our planet uh, as the linked biological and physical system that it is. Uh, and there's literally half a degree of potential global warming that could be avoided by doing that. Uh, so, uh, as we think about all of these things, that actually can play in a positive way to some of the biodiversity uh, conservation we were uh, uh, considering in the, in the two earlier talks. Uh, so, on a more hopeful note about international negotiations, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, having spent, in my view, almost too much time on access and benefit sharing and biosafety protocols, uh, is now, I think, in a much more serious frame of mind, both as a set of governments and as a secretariat. So whereas in um, 2010, uh, at the 10th Conference of the Parties uh, in Nagoya, every single nation had to admit that it had failed to meet the biodiversity conservation goals that they had set. Uh, they have a whole new set of targets uh, set uh, about the same time in Aichi, uh, and they were just meeting uh, this past week and the week before in India uh, to really seriously consider how they're actually going to make those targets. Uh, the Secretariat is now led by a, a Brazilian, Braulio Dias, who's uh, bound and determined that he's going to make a huge difference uh, through the, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And the big issue is more than anything else is going to be the necessary financial resources to do it. Uh, a hard thing to raise in a world uh, with the economic conditions uh, that we currently have, uh, but really cheap, uh, inexpensive uh, in the overall scheme of things. So that's something to both keep an eye on and look for ways that we all can sort of promote. So uh, what thrills me about this particular symposium is this emphasis on a global scale. Uh, taking on the issue at the scale it deserves. Uh, and there are lots and bits and pieces that are sort of trending in this direction around the world, particularly in uh, civil society uh, and in academia. Uh, and I just think we all need to wake up every morning remembering that the problem is as big as it is, and we should be pushing for as big a scale response uh, as society is capable of. So that's what I really wanted to say about global uh, scale of things. Uh, let's just always remember how big the problem is uh, and wake up every morning uh, newly fired up to do something about that. So, the other part of what I wanted to talk about, and uh, I probably won't use my whole allotted time, uh, is how important this spatial biodiversity science really is. Uh, because what we, if, we are, if we are to succeed in minimizing the loss of biological diversity on, on the planet at the same time 
as we deal with the increasing human numbers and resource needs uh, that John displayed in such a simple uh, and straightforward graphic, uh, we're going to have to have serious integrated uh, development planning in large units of landscape. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the Amazon, which I usually talk about. It needs that very much. But I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the savanna regions of Africa, which are now down to about 30% of their original extent. Uh, and all the glorious biodiversity of African savannas that we all rejoice in uh, you know, is down in many cases, at close to 10% of its original population levels. Uh, and that's a continent with rapidly growing population, uh, rapidly growing needs uh, in terms of, of food, and which is also being looked to by other parts of the world as a potential future source of food. And it is also uh, a place where there are all these uh, mining and other natural resource interests that are coming in from the outside, and you get a picture uh, that looks like uh, the map we saw of deforestation and logging roads uh, in the Congo. Uh, so I think we have to take the knowledge we already have, which you can see is considerable, uh, and work that in to development planning uh, at large regional scales. So the other supposed uh, and the real needs of society get met, but in a way that has uh, far fewer downsides uh, for biological diversity. Uh, and you, know, you can make the same case over again for, say, the Mekong River uh, and the dams that people are thinking of putting on the Mekong River, uh, which uh, would have huge impact on freshwater biodiversity, uh, would hit the, the fisheries of Cambodia and ultimately uh, the rice basket of Vietnam. So all of these things really need to be put together in, in regional planning, uh, something that uh, in the end may create more opportunity than it restricts. We have to just simply redefine uh, uh, how we recognize opportunity uh, and have all of these things be part of a conversation between all these different elements, uh, not the least of which uh, are the local communities. Uh, so I think that is the, the challenge in front of us. I don't think I need to belabor it any further. Uh, I just really applaud this. Uh, symposium uh, combining both that global scale uh, and the need for spatial planning. Thank you very much. Sure. Take time for a couple questions before we recess. Yes. Up on your landscape scale planning point there, and also the last speakers talking about the sociological aspects. Particularly, you closed on talking about the importance of local communities. So that's an often the difficult road to navigate. We're hearing the uh, global land grabs, including green grabs, biodiversity hotspots, and things like that. What are you seeing in terms of the best efforts? or the best examples of people doing that right, thinking about spatial scale from a biodiversity, but also from an economic and a community point of view? Well, that's a really tough question, because I immediately think of ones where it could be better. Uh, so I think if you take it down to uh, a level of maybe a state government, uh, that what's been going on in the state of Amazonas in the Amazon uh, or in Acre. Acre is probably a better example. 
uh, all of those things get brought into uh, the way it, it is both planned and engaged in and works. Uh, and Acre is a better example because there seems to be more consistent political will from uh, uh, government administration to government administration. Uh, the history on that in Amazonas is shorter and uh, more volatile. Uh, so, uh, and maybe, maybe it would be interesting to go back and, and look at the example of Costa Rica once again because uh, a lot has changed over 30 or 40 years, both in terms of forest regrowth, regrowth but also, I think, community engagement as well. Yeah. One more question? Yes. So we know biodiversity data are limiting from Walter's talk, and there's this welcome development time around the world of sites coming get integrated sites to understand biodiversity in particular regions. Think of the SIGO sites, the team sites, the CI, NEON would be an example in the US. And from your work in Amazonia, you were really one of the fathers in getting site-based uh, biodiversity studies going in that, in that part of the world. I guess my question would be, in order to sort of bulk up the, these biodiversity observations, which are limited, in order to really understand what's happening, serve it. What can we do to better integrate those site networks out there to sort of bring a, a comprehensive whole to these now discrete efforts to observe biodiversity in some very important parts of the world? So I suppose we could think of a sort of a, a green biodiversity peace corps, right? Uh, you know. Part of, part of what we just simply have to deal with is being content to act on the information we have uh, because we really are in the end game uh, in a number of ways. And you know, the, the number of protected areas that will be uh, created after the next decade or so will be pretty small, uh, which means it's hugely important for us not only to be focusing on that, but focusing on the larger landscape. Uh, and I think we really need to emphasize the importance of integrating protected areas into a larger landscape that has connections in it uh, so that species can move around, you know, like the Joshua trees are uh, marching out of Joshua Tree National Park. Uh, and then we have to sort of keep thinking about it as a series of approximations. Uh, and successive refining of what we think needs to be done to sort of the, the face of, of both the terrestrial part of the planet, but also the marine. All right. Well, let's thank Tom and the rest of the speakers for this afternoon's session.